Amen. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time of conversation. Help us understand more deeply what literature you've given us. Help us to fall in love with it more and more. We entrust this time and this conversation to the hands of our mother as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, so we had read through uh, the important guide. Uh, but I want to just a couple of think points we had covered last time just to reiterate. Uh, let's see. So I guess the date that I covered 46. So we go back to 47. Uh, just beauty, the notion of beauty. We said last time that 46. That everything we're doing is, is to show God's presence. It's to show to us, remind us that Christ is present. So all the stuff that happens in the Mass, the liturgy, remember, isn't just the Mass, it's all the sacraments, it's the divine office, the other public prayers, the church. It's to remind us of Christ's presence, bring it happen, there to bring about salvation. And one of the aspects of it that shows this well is the aspect of beauty. So as Paul Bannon said, beauty is not mere decoration. It's not something simply added to the Mass. The Mass is supposed to be beautiful, the Mass is supposed to be glorious. Because what's happening in the Mass is beautiful, is glorious, we can see it with the eyes of God. What happens in the Mass is salvation, it's God coming to save his people, it is the union of God and man. And that is glorious and wonderful and incredible. And so having a liturgy, having a, a the gestures, the vestments, and a, a building and everything else done beautifully isn't an optional extra. So it says Pope Adam in 16. This is something that's necessary. Because that too is a way of preaching and showing who God is. That too was a way of explaining God's own glory. There's a famous story of the Russian uh, monarchs. <clears throat> and around the 10th, 11th century, one of the emperors of Russia, one of the czars of Russia, um, said, I, I want the, a religion that unites us as, as Russian people. Now I'm going to go and send emissaries to all the different representatives around the world and find of all the different religions to figure out which one is the true religion, to figure out which one is, is God's religion, nor practice it as a people. And they went around to the different places. They were rushed off to Mongolia, to China, to, to the Europe, to the pagan places. They were, they were, they were all pagans at that point. When the emissaries got to the great cathedral in Byzantium, the Hagia Sophia. What was that? What, 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 I didn't hear the last thing you said. We got the Hagia Sophia, Constantinople. Oh. Uh, Byzantium. Okay. The, the great cathedral of the Hagia Sophia, which is now the mosque since 1456. But the great cathedral of the Hagia Sophia was built in the 4th century. Um, one of the largest churches of Christmas I would ever made. And when they got there, they said between the art and the music and the liturgy, they said they didn't know if they were standing in heaven or on earth. And because of that, Russia became Catholic by attending mass. That's how important beauty is. That's how important a good mass is, how important a building is, 
And that's why the Pope said it's not an optional extra. Everyone in those parts and other things is done doing things well. Communicate. We do things sloppily, you do things lovely way, you do you have a church that he was talking to to a convert here recently. Uh, I went to school with a uh, group of priests called the Society of St. John Cantius. And their charism, the Dominican's charism is to preach, this charism is to take care of the poor. The charism of St. John Cantius is to do liturgy well, to make beautiful masses. And they've rescued over in Chicago three or four tractor trailers full of things that were thrown out in the 1970s at the churches. Vestments, chalices, relics. The people have decided we're old-fashioned and everything anymore. They just threw them in the garbage. There was one case that was telling me they had one giant case. There were 500 relics of it. That was thrown in the trash. Oh my gosh. Uh, there was a priest who taught me literature over at uh, Mount St. Mary's. Infant guy. He, uh, he started out as a Presbyterian, became a Lutheran minister, became an Anglican priest, <laughs> became uh, Eastern Orthodox, then became a Catholic. <laughs> Go to see it, bro. <laughs> Take a long way around. <laughs> so that's those every time. But when he was a Lutheran, someone gave him a challenge. They had fished out of a trash can at the Catholic Church. As he was using it for Lutheran services, so that was a nice pretty chalice, and being a Catholic priest. Was it gold at all? Was it gold? He, when he was, it was silver. Oh, silver. Well, he, he, the priest had the branch that nobody could be cleaned up and we need to the mass once again. We, we had it for another 50, 20 years at that point. It was solid silver with over $20,000. Oh, wow. oh, wow. Been thrown on the trash. Oh. One man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> well, more than that, they've been, oh, yeah. so there was a movement in the seventies that said beauty doesn't matter. Get rid of it. None of this matters. You can tear it all down. <laughs> this matters. You have an ugly church. You have an ugly building. You have an ugly liturgy. That's going to speak about who God is. You have a beautiful church, a beautiful liturgy, a beautiful music. Thank you. It's going to speak about who God is. And this is what the Pope is telling us, is that this is not optional. Now, obviously, you know, there, you know we do, we can't. You know, there will be times we can't. Uh, at Fort Trump, every single church, big glorious cathedral, and we have a 40 part orchestra, and they fly. Nice if we could. Something. But we do can't. Um, but, but everything, even, even simple, can be beautiful. Everything, even, even small and humble, can be beautiful. But the beauty is so important because God is beautiful. God Himself is the first beauty. And so when things are beautiful and done well, they point to God's beauty. This is an important element of this. So in the 448, we read this quote again for the last time. So our obedience for the church says in the liturgy, asks of us in the liturgy, to do following the rules, do things the right way. It's not simply a matter of following over its rules. It's not just obedience because the church says so. Not just because we have it. It's rather allowing the beauty of the liturgy to express the beauty of God Himself, although invisible in sacramental signs. <clears throat> I read a description once uh, of a, a church, and it was described as a holy as such. And this was an old writing, um, it goes back to the 18th century, I think. But it describes the cathedral, and they say that you know, the the, the tracer on the windows preaches God's glory, and the stone sings out God's goodness, and the altar says God's grandeur and God's might, and the pillars talk about God's strength. And the stained glass windows show God's beauty of the saints. So every element in the church points to God's beauty, points to God's goodness, points, points to God. Uh, 
And so when we follow the rubric of the Mass, you know, the church tells us, stand a certain way, sit a certain way, walk a certain way, say certain things. It's not because the, the church is OCD. It's not because, you know, these elements are, you know, are, are unchangeable necessarily. Hold your hands this far, that far. But think to yourself of a soul of, of a soldier. Has anyone been to the DC two dead on soldier? Has anyone seen that? So the two of them on soldier, um, it's interesting. So it's, it's, it's been, the wine has been there, I want to say, since the Civil War. Um, and 24 7, they're a soldier out there. It's a matter of it's snowing, it's a matter of rain, it's a matter of it's. So there's a particular thing they do several. Every 15 minutes, they walk a certain number of distance, uh, they turn around a certain time. The extent where, where the paved stone. There, you can see the mark of the feet. You know, the, the, there, there is a groove worn in the paving stone in front of the front of it. And they only choose the best and the brightest. The only choose, you can't, I don't to do this. You have to be trained for months and for a long time to do this right. This is this particular timing, a particular ceremony, the training of the guards, to walk a certain number of feet because you're giving honors. If they're going to go out there and be like, yeah, you know, we're here, you know, <laughs> you're not young soldier, <laughs> hey guys. There's lots of videos on YouTube of people messing with the guy. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I, 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 I like the, uh, the guards. I like the guards that, that they the bucked his house. They just pretty quiet. Right. But yeah, the young soldier, the, the, they, they'll be out of They've been trained to out there, they'll train to even use deadly force. American versus the British mentality, I guess. <laughs> we are walking on pallets, right? There's a certain way they stand, a certain way they move, a certain way they walk. And, and again, no one would think of asking this of the soldiers, you know, to, you know, how come you, you have to walk so straight? Why do you just slouch around and sit around? You know, because you're giving honor to the king of the country. And so the priests and the servers are as an honor guard for the king of kings. The priests and the servers are, are there walking by and standing by and processing with Christ. And so, if an earthly king or an earthly government wants their soldiers to act a certain way, walk a certain way, and do a certain thing, that's not considered you know, bad or stupid or ridiculous. The same thing is true of those who serve and walk with the king of kings. Those who and so following these rules, doing these things, isn't about the rule. It's about showing the honor and the glory and the love of to God. Which thereby shows us who God is. Right? You don't, you don't, if you guard something well with care, it shows precious. If you, if, you, if, if you don't guard it with care, very much care at all, it's not around over it. You're saying it doesn't matter very much. You don't have people walking in procession in very carefully straight lines over the underwear now. For important things you do. Um, and because of that, it says no one can add change or move anything. And so the, the law of the church, the church law that isn't simply this constraint. We, we have this um, very automatic law in our country right now. We think of laws as bad. We think of laws as hindrance to freedom. The thing is, law actually makes you free. There's a couple of reasons for this. One of the reasons that law makes you free is because well, first of all, it shows you how to conform your heart, your mind, your will to God. So it gives you direction and guidance and do things the right way. But secondly, it's human being right. And so we can't function with, with too much. If the sound's too loud, you can't hear it. If the light's too bright, you don't see it. 
If I gave you a random word and there, there was no definition to it, it would have no meaning. To define something literally means to show the limits of it. Define it. Of the limits. If scientists discover something new, whether they're going to weigh it, they're going to measure it, they're going to tell you what, what it can and can't do, then they'll know what it is. And so law gives us the limits of how to act in the proper way of following up. If it's a good law. Where it says, this is how you serve it, this is how you walk with God, this is how you please God. This is how you think like God, think love like God loves, and do what God does. And so without the law, we wouldn't know how to do it. We wouldn't know how to hold God the right way. We wouldn't know how, how to live with God or to serve God. He wants us to. But the law makes us free to serve God, become like God, love God, and please Him. And so following the laws of the liturgy is <clears throat> not just simply something random that keeps us from doing from being free. We can't be spontaneous because we have all these not law now. It's these laws make us free to please God, to love God, and to be close to Him. Because they show us how to do it the right way. So following the laws of the Mass, following the laws of the liturgy, something to take up with joy and with gladness and with care. Okay. I think that brought us up now to the current argument. Any questions before we go on to number 50? Please, Dan. Explain rubrics. Rubrics, okay. Very good. So if you look at the priest book, you'll notice that there's two different colors in there, main, main colors. And there is the black, and there is the red. And so there's, there's words written in black, words are red. So the word red in Latin is uh, rubric, which we get the word rubric. These are the red letters, the red words. <coughs> and what? So These are the words written in red. So the word ruber is red in Latin. So rubric means the words written in red. And so the words you say are written in black. And what the words in red are what you do. So these are the instructions of what to say and when to say it. And I wish I had an example. Let me give you a little quick example on my phone. I keep forgetting about that. But you look at, at a priest missile and you'll see that in four or something in English. <laughs> So there's our instructions. Is there a problem? So basically, so, okay, so it's kind of, it's like an instruction for you. Yeah. As you're saying, the Mass. And so it's just printed right in there. And, and so it's a way to distinguish which one's which. So, right. so, so, you don't, so I don't accidentally say the priest, so I don't know the other words, say, so, you know, the priest opens his hands, the priest turns around. <laughs> So it's kind of like, even in our, in our Latin, we 
this world where it explains what's going on. I guess that, in that even though it's not written in the, in the book, but by definition, they could because it's explaining what's going right. on. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same sense as far as in your kind of yeah. Except the rubrics are rubrics are very instructive. There's an old joke. I don't remember the. It's one of the punchline. I don't tell right. There's a new priest about to do the wedding for the first time, and the old priest had the little rubrics written in, in, in the highlights, and uh, he gets the part after, after after the wedding vows. He, he goes, he gets ready to kiss. He goes, oh wait, you're supposed to do that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just that it's so, so I guess the, the uh, rubrics, in a sense, as far as Catholic Mass, is the standardization of which all Masses are carried out. And yeah, so the, 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 the rubrics then became simply a, 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 a word that means all of the rules on how to do things. Uh, so it comes from the Mass book, okay. uh, where it would be printed in red so that you can put it in the middle of all the black text. That being, that being confusing. And that way, you know, you want to have somebody accidentally be saying, you know, <laughs> priest opens his hands, or priest turns face to the people, you know, and then the other things. What? So, which leads to another question then. So, all the rubrics is the same in all the Catholic Mass books? Yes. So, what happens when you go to a Mass, like in our experience, when we went? Are they really following the rubrics? Or? Well, probably not. Um, so the, the up until nineteen sixty four, the rubrics were very, very, very carefully practiced, and perhaps even to a point where it got overkill. You know, we've had the priest practicing four inches was the number, was the number of inches supposed to be added to the apart. The seminary would practice with a piece of string on their hands to know how, what it felt like to open your hand in the proper distance. Maybe that's overkill, maybe. Then back in the 60s, they, threw all, they threw all these things. And for what happened was, from 1960 to 1970, there were five different missiles. Remember in 2011, we changed our some word to translation? Remember the uproar about that, the confusion there was? Imagine for, for a period of eight years, every two years being a new missile. Not a new translation, a new missile. And so they actually a bank up with the Bantinger Brothers, because it was the biggest publisher in the family in the world that uh, because they would get these big print runs. And then they know they, they had to come and sell it because two years later there's new missile. And so they had do it all over scratch. And then from like 1970, they were all bankrupt. They closed down. If you go if you go back and look at all the books, all, it's all bad in books. After that, they disappeared because of that, that, that translation. Um, but the this, one of the results of that was because things were just, were just changing around, around so much. That, the, <laughs> Someone changed the picture. Oh. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> well, I gave one English. I gave one English, not that one in the. Oh, that one's If you give so every priest the same rubric, it would be like giving everybody in this room a recipe for cookies. We'd all come back with different cookies. <laughs> because somebody's not going to follow all the directions. Like each one of us is going to miss something. Well, what would happen in the round like in 70, because things would change so quickly. Basically, your, your practice became just have narratives. You can read, there's no practice. So, you imagine where a practice to being told, you can, you can read, you've been to Mass, you don't need to practice. <clears throat> and so, as a result, that's why you have sort of these very kind of fluid interpretations. The other thing that happens here, too, is that some of these rubrics presume another knowledge. So, for example, it says make a sign of the cross. This is a very simple example. What does that mean? Does that mean this? Does that mean this? Does that mean this? All those are signs of the cross. If you had no idea what that looked like, you wouldn't know. But you, you know what that looks like because of other knowledge. It 
doesn't describe that in there, it's an extended clause. Yeah. And so there are certain things that relies upon, tradition that relies upon, which it expects you to know. What that means, you have to have an all in the background. If someone doesn't have an all in the background, you end up with some very strange interpretations. So, uh, as you can see, that that's that's basically what I said. I have a 62 missile. Okay. In that, are, well, half the second, half the sentences are in red, and half the sentences are in black. So, is that the same type of thing? Yeah. The yeah. red and the black? Yeah, so if you look at all the red words, aren't words I say. They're simply words that I do. Okay. So, yeah. So, the red words were written that way to so distinguish from your eyes, not to, I don't say it. Um, otherwise, we have a very strange mask. <laughs> In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the priest of the sign of the cross. I have to get a different color, and I was the priest not doing that. It sounds like you've practiced that a few times. <laughs> um, but yeah. So I think you have a question. Yeah, it's just that you say that it shouldn't change when it says right here, be nobody even be a priest by adding over changing the liturgy on its own authority and that's being done. Right. You know, like I said it's clown kind of passes you know, it's it's acrobats or <laughs> dancers. Uh, unfortunately the law is not being upheld by the authorities of the people. Mm -hmm. Right? The cops will ever close so over speeding. Very few speed. Mm -hmm. There is say it doesn't matter, speed doesn't matter because it was law in the books, you know, it all carried them. Mm -hmm. And so if people aren't holding the rubrics and enforcing them, the law is probably there. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. So who's the rubrics police? I mean, I have the bishop. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the bishop in his diocese is the head of everything. He doesn't have to agree on that. He's the chief liturgist, he's the chief catechist, chief exorcist, it all goes to him. He, he's the successor to the apostles and his job is as best he can. Now, the, the priest is not with them, and sometimes when these little parishes are diocese like ours, you know, the bishop is able to come around a couple times every few years. You know, I think he's, he's had to cancel us the last three years, I think, uh, because of sicknesses, because of just things. Um, so there may be times where he's just, just, just uh, presuming the pastor's doing his job. If no one tells him he's not doing the job, they go, they're not always done. And ultimately, it's the bishop's job. And then the pastor, I mean, but yeah. Because again, it's not, again, it's not about the laws are all making them free to worship God, to show the gods. Any other questions? All right. Let's go on then to 50. I'm well, probably start with 51 as well. I think 50 is three lines long. So, I'll just remember it quick. Help us to enter into the liturgy on a daily basis more fully, more full, conscious, active participation. As such, with essentials in mind, to emphasize as well some practical matters that we just implement as a way to foster in their liturgical lives for our parish and families. So, liturgy not only in the parish, but also at home and family. It also belongs as everything. Preparation. Anything that is worthwhile involves some degree of preparation. Sports fans know this. Unless one has to purchase tickets, often not in advance. You must also know the details of the game and players in suit of the sport. Right, the less you know about a game, the more bored you're going to be. The less you know who's playing and why they're playing and what they're doing, the more you're, less you're going to care about the game. To say nothing of those avid fans who travel great distances to see their favorite team. 
but even to arrive hours early, it's best to throw a tailgate party. <laughs> they ready to get their tailgate parties here in the group every last day. Three in the morning, six in the morning, they have <laughs> breakfast tailgate parties. <laughs> Christ is coming. Don't give us any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> It would just throw off us being able to go to communion. Well, as long as you ran into the time. <laughs> right, in an air for mass. <laughs> and as long as you don't know this, there's parties and there's parties, right? It's a morning party, you probably drink the drinking beer and the whiskey. And <laughs> you come and rally the mass all the while. <laughs> now, if this is true for every sporting event, how much more is it true for participating in the life of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? We cannot simply wander into the preparation and expect to get something in the mass. Venerable Fulton, she used to say, Do you know the reason why you don't bring anything out of mass? It's because you don't bring anything to it. The question then is how do you prepare for mass? How do you bring it in our hearts? Intimacy is always comes right before mass and leaves like out the door. Oh, this is going to get recorded then. And he yeah. gets to listen to it when he happens too. Here you say that stuff. Maybe we'll let that part out. We call it out by name. <laughs> um, yeah, so. The people who come to Mass, knowing what it is, not understanding what they're doing, they're going to be born. Because honestly, if you go to Mass thinking it's all about you or thinking you're, you're there just for the little white thing, or thinking you're there just, just for a catechism lesson, why do we bother then with the way you dress, the way you act, the way you stand, the way you, what's all the folder all of what what's none of that means anything? If it's just about those things. And so people then get bored of it, and people will leave early, and people won't come, you know, unless they really have to, and people will end up only coming for the big days when there's a, a you know, Christmas Easter. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Is that what was going on in Paul's epistles where he criticizes them for saying some of you leave and get drunk and mothers have nothing? Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, so I mean, up until the first 30, 40 years, there were, there were some things that were being figured out the first 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> because the Last Supper happened, the, the first Mass happened in the context of a feast. Um, the early Mass, some of them did happen in the middle of a feast as well. Yeah. In the middle of a feast is a meal. A meal. Uh, and so people would have a meal as well. And the, 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 the fast did, did apply in the first couple decades. That was later on when they realized something different in the ordinary feast. Or not that they realized it for the first time, they realized they need to emphasize it in a different way. Um, so, so it went from being kind of emulated the Last Supper, which was a meal and had other things, and then, then the Mass was in the middle of that, to that people would try to celebrate their, their Sunday dinner, basically. Their Sunday dinner and also the Mass. But yeah, in the midst of it, there are people who have everyone kind of bring their own stuff, and rather than sharing, in certain places, you know, you have the wealthy people, you know, with their servants bring all their nice stuff, all their nice wines, and it would be for me, because that's, that's my food. <laughs> and so it became kind of the status symbol, and that's what Paul's had up. But certainly there was also involved. If those things become a status symbol, you're not focusing on what's really happening, not understanding what's going on. So yes, that, that's good. So you tell me a party, make sure you share. <laughs> Fifty-three. 
One way to repair a mass over time is to read some book helps you understand what's happening. That's what we're doing right now. We're learning, thinking about. <laughs> this can be a commentary on the mass for readings. There's some more ones out there. A devotional book for an explanation of the Catholic religion. The suggested reading list at the end is about exhortation to help you find at least one of your things to read. <clears throat> Additionally, parishes can and should offer the original information by the faithful and help them understand the sacred mysteries. So if you look at the back of the page 29. I'm going to throw one more on here. It's not on here. The can is republished. What page are you on? Page 29. So I'm going to throw one more on here. Assuming this applies, what about those of us who go to the Latin Mass? Because isn't that a different liturgical calendar or reading? Different liturgical calendar and readings, but there's time out there. So, so, first of all, the main part of the Mass is going to be the same. Right? The Mass is the Mass. Right. Um, but yes, there, there are different books, there are different readings, there are different. But you can, honestly, if you got anything older than 1954, 1962, it's going to be the Latin Mass. <clears throat> um, so uh, there's a lot of ones out there. Uh, uh, but this is this is this is my uh, But certainly it's it's, it's something I would recommend to anybody. Latin Mass or not, but it was written for the Latin Mass because it was another sort of this one. Um, but yeah, if you get look for a commentary on the readings, you can pull up a reading, you know, the commentary that was like that as well. Um, I won't apply in the same way the Latin Mass is a different cycle. So it did, it was a one year cycle rather than a three year cycle. The same reading, the same, the same, same Bible, but a different set of readings. So, yeah, the, the, so the Sunday of Easter might have a different reading than the you're seeing in Yeah. Good. Fifty-four. More immediately, preparation can be as simple and prayerful as reading of the mass text and readings for a given day. Perhaps the night before. The old custom of having a personal hand missile here in Helpful Forms. The day the Roman Missal from the Midwest goes before the forum, so it goes on weekday, Sunday missile, we figure the publication of resource in this regard. To prepare ourselves, we should ask the Lord for good graces. Either for ourselves or for others. We should have intentionality in our spiritual prayer. Let's look at this word intentionality. Or deliberate. Intention. Why does it matter to come to Mass in an intentional way? What difference does it make how intentional I am about mass, how I pray, and what I'm doing? Makes it more personal. You get more out of it. You get more out of it. Makes you participate. As you participate. Yeah. 
of coming to Mass haphazardly, not deliberately, you know, come to Mass deliberately, make every act a liberal act of love, everything you're doing. You're doing. And so when we come to Mass, it's not simply, I gotta show up. Who cares about thinking about Mass or praying or, you know, you, you participate. I didn't use to sing at all, and when we were in college, Daniel finally convinced me to start singing. It's not for these ones that judge my, my voice, it's for God. So I always try to sing. Me and Terry are the only you hear sometimes. I'm like, come on, people. <laughs> Let this lotus Casey, uh, not for a mass, but like. And uh, he was a Francisco over in Michigan, Detroit. A uh, great brother. He was, he was kind of like the Padre Pio of the United States in the 50s and 60s. Great right miracle world. Uh, kind of a good. But he used to play violin very badly. <laughs> and he, he would play his violin, sing very badly uh, for, 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 the, for the brothers you know, when he was in the recreation. <laughs> And he would say, well, God gave me this voice, I'm going to get back to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> None of us really have a good voice. Yeah. The choir does, but yeah. the rest of us are kind of screwed. <laughs> so. yeah. Let's do our best. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, yeah, so we, we come to Mass, again, it goes back to the rubrics. Right? The rubrics are, are a guide. You know, for the priest, the rubrics are a guide to make start doing everything but the appropriate way, intentionally. But those, but those aren't priests, you know, and yes, but, you know, just about the last time, uh, you might find it easier to participate by you know, another meditation or other prayers. Make sure we're doing it intentionally. Make sure it's a deliberate act of love. Make sure what you're sitting, what you're saying, what you're doing doesn't have happen. Is it just, I feel like I'm right. I don't feel like it's, I'm coming to visit my God and my King. I'm going to approach Him with all the reverence, I'm going to give Him my best. That's the intention, that's the need to prepare. You know, any guest comes to your house, are you going to prepare for them? <laughs> Basically, you know, yeah, I know it's in your house, you're going to get ready, you're going to make sure your house clean, you're going to, you have the guests come. Prepare for them. Be intentional about it, be deliberate about it. You know, if you have a cast, if you guess what's the peanut butter, I'm going to serve peanut butter cookies. Maybe you don't like them very much. <laughs> you know, if you, you know, someone has told you, here's how you serve me and please me, you're going to do that. The more intentional we are, the more deliberate we are, the more thoughtful we are with that, the more we're going to be able to participate and to receive from our Lord. You must remember in this regard that we're part of our class to receive the whole community. One hour is not very long. Even just a small sack of self denial helps to repair mentally and physically to come in the presence of God. You have to say, okay, I'm going to be in God's presence, I have to stop that. It's just one more thing to think about, one more reminder that we're, going to, we're approaching the altar, approaching Christ. And those reminders are good for us, help to us. Because we are small and the feeble brains. We will easily forget as we have these. These laws, boundaries, these sheep gates that keep us from wandering off. <laughs> here's here, here's where. I'd also very urge everyone to arrive at the mass room at least 15 minutes. We show up right as mass begins or worse late. Make sure the gods are not in our lives. I have difficulty shrugging off the way the world is being invited here to pray. Arriving early allows us time to calm down and pray with high attention and devotion. Yet, there are of course circumstances, more and more in the very children, to extraordinary constants, the road, the weather, etc. We can talk as time or length. These are understandable on their firm kind of situations. If you can't help it, it's different. But if you can't help it, come early, calm your heart down, think out the knowing thoughts, stop thinking about the dinner, stop thinking about what Bessie said to you yesterday on the telephone. Clear your heart, clear your mind, ready to do it. And, uh, that was the morning before Mass coincided with this 
No, so no one has to join the rosary. The rosary is there for a couple of reasons. One is because people used to talk about it. What? People used to talk about the church before Mass. It teaches us to talk? People used to talk a lot in Mass before church. So praying the rosary, never shut up. Never be quiet, everyone calm down. Um, and and so, so, so the first thing is just use an atmosphere of prayer. But if someone came in and didn't want to join the rose with the absolute, then I don't have to. Someone came in and wanted to do their own prayers, great. The rosary is one public prayer that everyone knows, which is helpful toward the Mass. It is designed to think about Christ's life, thinking about what Christ is doing, and thinking about what's happening in the Mass. And so it is one helpful guy, way to think about what you're about to do. But if someone wants to come and do their own prayer, there's nothing wrong with that. This is just simply a way to make an atmosphere of prayer, to get everyone chatting, and to promote, remind people of prayer performance. But we, we, we could have done, I think, we could have done, you know, the final office, we could have done the chapel, we could have done other things. We just chose the rosary here as something everybody knew. But uh, certainly, if if one day you want to come and say, you know, I don't want to pray the rosary, I, I want to go read the scripture instead, beautiful. Just don't talk to your neighbor about you know what what, what color the sky was yesterday. The great sunset you saw. Some may raise the objection that praying the rosary vocally interferes with their meditation. Well, and if everybody were quiet, that might be a good objection. But talking and chatting with your neighbor is a bigger interference in meditation, I guarantee you. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, if somebody... If somebody came and truly wanted to meditate and to pray in other ways, I think they would find those ways. Additionally, we also stop at least 10 minutes or more before Mass. And, and so the rosary doesn't, doesn't usually... Sometimes it does. Usually the rosary ends at least 10 to 15 minutes before, before Mass begins. And so there is plenty of time to do your own private prayer as well. Um, so it's not rosary all the way through up until Mass begins. Final preparation for Mass also necessarily includes regular confession, especially for mortal sins. Confession is the primary sacramental way in which souls are prepared to meet the Lord. I recommend to all a monthly confession, if not more regular. I also would spend this time to do my encouragement to our priests to be generous and offer the sacrament of reconciliation. Your time to bring confession is always time well spent. The bishop is using these words. But if you look at the older books on the Mass, they would describe three different kinds of preparation. They called it the remote, actually the very remote, the remote and the proximate. So the very remote preparation, that was a, that, that's your life. Are you living in mortal sin? Are you going to Mass generally? Like, are you trying to follow God? If you're not living a, a good life, you're in mortal sin, if you're ignoring God, you go into Mass, it's not going to do you much good. You're not going to participate very well. The remote, they would say, that would have to be the night before, the day before, Many of the saints, like before they go to Mass, would be saying prayer, saying the prayer said before. Like, help me to pay attention, help me to listen, help me to stay awake, help me to engage in the right way. So many saints, the night before, two hours before, they begin the preparation, it was simple small prayers. 
the proximate, when you get to the church, you lay aside and other things, you put, you put aside the food for the hour. Uh, but this one, you have, you have this very deliberate preparation. I'll talk afterwards about that on Thanksgiving. But, so these things are helpful then uh, in um, engaging and preparing and walking with our Lord in the Mass. You know, living a good life, that's the confession, the other sacraments. Uh, they're about, this used to include the fast, back in the fact is from midnight. That our board had, not much so they didn't count that as their mother's box. But uh, you could put it another one. But the, the more immediate, the not right by the board, the right board. So the prayers, you're getting changed, you're getting ready. You know, those things are all going part of your year preparation. One thing I was going to mention too, just in that note, there was a beautiful custom that I think we'd be forgotten these days sometimes. Um, that there were certain clothes for Sunday. There were certain things that were for Sunday long. Right? right? You had your Sunday hat, your Sunday dress, your Sunday shoes, your Sunday suit. And what it did was you got to church, and even before you got there, this was the clothes you wore for God. You had the mass, when I went to mass, I put on special clothes only I'd wear a mask. So I could walk around in my vestments. It's not very long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're there for math, it's not for anything else. And what that does is the moment I begin to put them on, I can be concentrating in a special way that these, these things symbolize my gift to God, the symbol of the best stuff. Because we're having even small arms of clothing, you know, actually, a different pair of socks, the only for mats, or a handkerchief. It's not made anything big, but something that's only for God. Will help you recognize and understand what you're doing in a whole new way. It's one reason why I like the best. Uh, Men don't wear it. But it's something you don't have to wear anywhere else. You wear it in church. You don't have to wear it in the grocery store or the bowl. I don't think you will. <laughs> uh, those are the things that you wear for God. And so the it's one more way you kind of separate yourself from ordinary life do this extraordinary action of love and devotion. Uh, see, it's not a mask. I try to wear it. I wear it with black sneakers for daily mask. I have my church shoes. You're so that's that's more like, you know. Daily mask, we don't even know you're back there, but on Sunday it's clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. Yeah. <laughs> Black box says. Yeah. Sneak around when you have your back. <laughs> but it's helpful, right? It's, 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 it's a small thing, it's, it's not the most important thing in the world. But it's something that's helpful, even on a personal level, to say, I'm, I'm giving God something different. I'm very deliberately doing different things. Lots of people used to. People only bathe once a week, it's always Saturday night. For that reason, you know, you get the mass clean from the, from the, from the regular the work of the week. You dress nicely, you shave, you know, get your hair done from the press. So. Um, I was helping one of my grandsons prepare to be a server. And uh, so we're reading the book together, and it had those beautiful prayers that you did that we said, should say, whenever they walked on. Because each article has a type of prayer. Yes. Type prayers. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, uh, yeah, no, the, the, each article is on prayer and symbolism. So yeah. everything I'm putting on uh, means something different. Is there connected to our virtue or connected to the part of Christ's passion? And so each one of those things of prayer around the Mass of the Lord, first of all, make me like Christ. So I'm putting on his, putting his act on his garments, his virtues. But second of all, our mind of what Christ did for me. So each of those things I'm putting on isn't just, oh, it's old fashioned, looks good. It's each of these things means something, reminds of what Christ did, what's happening in the Mass, and asking God for it. It's, it's a prayer. Uh, people are right now is a similar thing. Mm -hmm. 
religious models uh, just because they come along with the cool. Not just a silly numbers. I had someone ask me that. And, uh, <laughs> Yes. It says that this is for purity. This is for open trust. Yes. Mm -hmm. Different things. Yeah. yeah. So we have a copy of. We had it broken. We had a class to teach part of the Okay. And that's as you. Yes. As you get it from us, each thing means something different. Yes. She's special. Oh, 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 Okay, I think we can get through the next. Okay. Thanksgiving. So we'll do that. Just as we have the public praise for Mass, we should also do well to call for proper acts of Thanksgiving afterwards. Consider for a moment the important events of life, birthdays, weddings, anniversaries, etc. In each case, gifts are given to the situations that celebrate a special day, the signs of love. There is a situation that are written in the proper expectation the person who received the gifts expresses gratitude, either by word of mouth or real thank you note, simply a part of how they manage virtues. Again, it applies to those important moments of our lives. I want to apply the most important thing we can possibly do with Mass. God Himself is choosing the gift Himself to us. To God Himself is choosing the gift Himself to us. He the gift Himself to us. So we are get that. God just us to thank Him for us. This takes place after Mass, either by means of spontaneous personal prayers or devotions like the Rosary. Or prepare the Thanksgiving composed for us to the present. Many saints easily accept with prayers to say after us. This, of course, means to say after us. But these two bands to, to pray instead of rushing out at the first chance. Now, we hover back into sports. Some games last four or five hours, and the fans willingly stay through the whole. I would ask them with us today, these are the disciples. Do you not watch me for one hour? It is rare for a mass to be longer than this on Sunday. But even if it does, this is not a waste of time. Keep the time with Jesus and the raw view of that precious time to Yeah. Thank God. Recognize you love me. In some ways, this is probably the most neglected of the prayers of men. They're very quick to tell that we need things, very quick to tell that we're sorry. That's what they're quicker than I'm sorry. He is help. Is it wrong to do Thanksgiving immediately after receiving communion? No. No. There's nothing wrong with that. But because of the fact, let me rephrase, let me put it back up. It's necessary to thank the Lord for right? after but because that time generally isn't very long, it's good to stay afterwards as well with the whole, to thank God for the whole Mass. Uh, because the whole Mass is one act and one, one part of the sacrifice. Um, yes, part of the sacrifice is, is a thanksgiving to God. And we should therefore thank God during the whole Mass. Um, it's good to thank God at the end of Mass, Mass finish before we go, as a way to kind of. Uh, Transition back to normal life. Um, so the transition, ordinarily, if we can, should be abrupt and quick. It should be we're there with our Lord, 
we finished that, that sacrifice with him, recognize what he's done for us, we talk to him, and then we move on with our day. Rather than that happen sometime that the final blessing goes and there is a, it's like the starter's done, and the people are trying to race out to leave. Um, actually, I'm, I'm proud of this parish because I think that's happening less and less here. I think we do a whole and very good job of thinking about that for this. Uh, but it is an important thing to do. It's just another way of recognizing, thinking back, what he's done for us. And what he's given us, what we just gone through. You know, this, this, this incredible fact that we just spent this hour ago. Uh, okay, we spent the hour done, now it's time to go. <laughs> if we're overly anxious to leave, we don't really appreciate what he's done. But yes, uh, it, um, there is very deliberately a time of silence after he, um, that's meant to be there for us to talk to God and be with God, recognize the folks to us. In the Mass, there's no such thing as dead space. There's no such thing as simply wait. Uh, whenever there is a quiet Mass that is deliberate, that's time to pray, a time to recognize what's happening. Um, comments, questions? You got one about the confession, but we'll talk about that next week because I want to drag this out until 5 30. I got questions about that because you read about the same, it talks about where the bishop says to go monthly at least. And I sit there and I think, and you read about the saints, they used to go weekly. Mm -hmm. And we live in a more tumultuous time in society today than they did, I would think. I need help getting my head around that because I know, I understand you have three parts for sin. You know, you have to act on the sin in order for it to become a moral sin. Correct? Right. But we can invest more than just moral sins. So for I said to be mortal. So confession is a couple of things. Yes, it grows to mortal sin, but absolutely the mortal sin go to confession. But even venial sin is helpful. Right? Because every sin and every even things that are imperfections, so the things where not least acts the will, but there are tendencies in my heart, can keep me from being close to God. So I might, I might have a tendency toward being you know, melancholy, violent. I do with that. <laughs> um, this can lead me to being self absorbed. The tendency I need to overcome and work on. Even where it's not the part where it's sinful, there are times where it is. Even where it's not sinful, there's still this inclination in me that should be purified and cleaned up. Um, so confession not only does it prevent to forget past sins, but strength against future temptation and future sins, as purifying. And a debt that I owe to God because of my sins. So every time I sin, I create distance and I create debt. And so, confession forgets my sin, but also for the debt I owe God. But as the sacrament is doing so in God's help and God's grace. And, and so it is a easier way than simply my own. Uh, now, the law of the church is one season. That's, that's the church law. The bishop's saying it's good to do it at least 12 times. Uh, but can you ignore that and not be in sin? Yes. But is it good to go anyway? Yes. But do you have to go? No. You're avoiding more than sin, but I hope you all are. But you don't have to. But is it good to go to remedial sins? Absolutely. Um, so and those are observations from my own life. You know, I tried to go every couple of weeks by the poster to, to a church that wasn't myself. Uh, <laughs> I would go probably weekly because I, I noticed that things get busy and I, I miss three or four weeks. I'm grumpier. I'm prone to temptation. Uh, I, I for a reason fall to sin. Now, God be praised. I don't think it's mortal sin. But even the venial sins, so I, I notice I don't pray as well. I, I don't, I'm not patient with people a lot of stuff. That's just 
I'll live three or four weeks. I can, I can feel the difference myself. I, I can notice the difference in how I respond to people and how I. So, you know, grandpa can say, Father, please, that's lazy. It makes me too long, Father. I feel like it makes you become more discerning of who you are and who you're being. And you're like more of a governor of yourself and you're like doing more. I guess my question is that yeah. in order to do that frequency, so when we come to confession, then even bring the temptations we're fighting, bring venial sins. I mean, you can bring all that to you other than the actual sin I may have committed. So, so at least bring the sin. You have to, there has to at least be a sin to confess. It absolutely one can bring because you're struggling with. Now, it's not just be spiritual practice. It must be a conversation about general advice. But if you are having trouble with your sins, of course, the menial the menial sins are the whole sins. But if, if you find yourself constantly getting angry with it, your spouse, for example. Uh, yeah, we'll go confess it, and maybe you'll get help in the confession. We'll get help. Maybe you'll get help, but if I get enough help, don't come. If I get advice, don't come. Uh, absolutely, the confession is there only as a healing. It's there as healing. And any sin is an obstacle to God, a view to God. St. Francis de Sales says, the devil can't hold you by a chain, he'll hold you by a hair. Right. The heavy chain keeps the bird from flying, but so can a hand. So, you know, and so our souls be flowing close to God. And the devil can't get hit by like serious moral sins, or at least he can make him grumpy and then no one can be around. He got close to God at that point, he'll keep you attached to the earth. Or he's keep you overly focused on the latest TV shows and you know food that you know that might it might not be enough to make you go to hell. But if it keeps you from being the great saint called to be, that makes it happen. I was going to make a comment there. I think it's so great that you offer confession before every Mass. And I have my kids who live in a much bigger, closer, much larger parish, thousands of people. They offer it like once or twice a, a week for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. You can't. It's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah. And then it also then makes it seem unimportant. Yeah, right. Uh, any other comments or questions? I'm scared to go take more of that out. You can come back again next week. <laughs> Did we have a conversation recently about? Calling somebody a jerk or uh, something. The guy that pulled in front of you, the guy that turned into that signal lane. Or... Do we have that? Uh, so, no, I think I gave a comment a few weeks ago, or a couple months ago, about an yes. example of you know, the self controlled patient. So, would that be considered a sin? If you're yelling at people, you can't hear you yet. That's a sin. Not a yeah. moral sin, but that would be a venial sin, yeah. Yeah. What a jerk he is. That's yeah. stupid he is. Yeah. That, 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 that a sin? Those, those are venial sins, yes. Yeah. Didn't hurt anybody. Didn't do anything. Didn't intend to. You just blurt this thing out. But it's, it's lack of self-control and it's anger. So... We're going to carry that just a tad over into our politicians. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. We need to know that. We got a group over here. Yes. <laughs> we got a group over here that screams about everything. We got a group over here that won't bother to defend themselves. Maybe because of this. These guys are losing. I don't think he meant for us to lose. Yes, um, but, 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 so don't, if you, if all the way you win is by the devil's tactics, it's not worth winning at that point. If you can only win by playing the devil's games, you lost. Right? So, so the only way you're going to win is by selling your soul. What you want isn't worth anything anymore. So, yes, absolutely. 
if, 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 if we were to um, do whatever, you know, sell our souls, kill people, we you know, t- we could do all kinds of things. We would end up finding what we had at the end as a world. Uh, there's a reason why um, knights in the old, the old days had a, a certain code of chivalry, the code of the way we act. It wasn't, so, it wasn't the code that made, made, made it harder for the fight, you know, to, to, to you have honor, if you have dignity, if you do things the right way. But the man at the end of the day, you're building a society that's worth it. Um, because it, if you fight in such a way where you're undermining truth and justice, you end up in the end losing everything. I don't think I said that. I would just say, voice your opinion on what you think is correct. Absolutely. And they're not. And we're losing. So you have to speak up for truth. You absolutely have to recognize that the bad is bad. You absolutely need to be able to say, these things aren't true, aren't good, and it's bad for all. You'd be able to say, these things are evil. It's evil to murder babies. It is evil to to pretend that that marriage between two men is the same thing yeah, as that, that last one was a good one because you're going to lose because of that. Yeah, yeah. If, pe- if people are quiet or say anything, you're going to lose. You can lose in two ways, right? Mm-hmm. If you can lose by being so quiet and, and, and not doing anything, you can lose by selling your soul. Absolutely. But at the same time, to yell and scream and hurt people is also not right. Well, I didn't mean to go that far. Good. <laughs> it does. But absolutely, you need to be able to say that's wrong. And let, you must not do that. You cannot do that ever. So if you're replying to a Facebook post, we got to come see you Sunday. <laughs> Depends on how you reply. <laughs> I don't do that. If you're applying, you can mother at them. Yeah, come see me. <laughs> That's the thing, too, nowadays. If you like, point out something that's you know wrong, <laughs> contrary to the teachings of God and of Christ, they say, well, it says in the Bible you should yeah. not judge, but there's a difference Absolutely. between judging and discerning between good and evil. And, but it also that's what people said, use to shut you down. It also it says, if a good man strikes or approves me, it's kindness. So if I hit you on the side of the peg to be an idiot, <laughs> I'm being kind to you. <laughs> that's also wrong. If a good man strikes or approves me, um, yes, to admonish the sinner's back to mercy. Absolutely. Yeah, and then people say, well, you're not supposed to judge, but it's not it's like really judging. The no. difference between judging actions and judging you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah, that's what yeah. people use these yeah. days to like, say, you know, to, to excuse any kind of evil. Well, you know, that's okay for those guys to... My, to my truth, your truth, truth yeah. my opinion. Yeah. yeah. It's all nonsense. Yeah. It's all nonsense if you have to be willing to say this is right, this is wrong. Even more important to say what those people are doing is wrong. You're doing the wrong thing. But that's different than saying I hate you, I want you to help. You can't condemn people, no. you must condemn actions, I want to be able to say what you're doing is wrong. Yeah. We have a son in law whose sister, you know, thinks she's a boy and you know, my daughter, but it, that, that's kind of stopped now. But they said, well, you hate gays. I'm like, I don't hate her, but she's not a man. <laughs> and then what was so funny, when we were visiting over Thanksgiving, my daughter, who's a nurse, told, the, told her, you know, you, you really should go, you know, the uh, checkup that women have to have. <laughs> because you're still a girl, basically. <laughs> but she didn't say it that way. Anyway, that's, that's the family stuff that we yeah. deal with. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely is true. We live in a day and age where we're afraid to speak the truth. Yeah. And we must, we must stop that. We must speak the truth. Even if people don't like the truth, they come out of the hearing. And we're kind to her, my husband and I. We're, you know, we don't snub her or anything like that. Or... And the fact is, 
she, she knows you, you're going to tell the truth, and I know she appreciates deep down. And the fact is, you hear over and over again that when people want help, the fact of the people who are just going to say whatever they want to make feel good. But I know that people are honest with that truth for them. So, yeah, that, that's so important. Good. Let's close with a prayer and want to marry Lay and to invite his back. Say. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and conversation again. Help us to understand more fully the Holy Sacrifice. Help us to live more completely. Help us to participate more fully. May all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And the mighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.